so much for joining us online. Uh, thank you for your patience and your grace in the midst of um, some confusion and uncertainty. Um, and we are definitely in a season of uncertainty. But one thing that we are certain of is that we follow and serve a God who is not caught off guard by anything. And so we are thankful for that this morning. Um, 20 years ago, uh, I took a group of students to the Boundary Waters in northern Minnesota. And uh, four out of the five days that we were there, it rained, it downpoured. Um, one night, one of those nights, we had 15 to 20 mile an hour winds. Now, that may not seem bad for you as you're sitting in your home right now watching this, um, but when you're in a tent and you're exposed to the elements, um, it can be fearful. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night and, and all the guys in our tent were, were awake and, and I remember looking at them and seeing fear and uncertainty in their eyes. And uh, I've never done this before and I've never done it again, but I remember opening my Bible and just opening it up and sticking my finger in the Bible and reading a verse. And this is the verse that we read that night as we were uh, dealing with fear and uncertainty in the Boundary Waters. Psalm 91 verse 9 and 10 because you have made the Lord your dwelling place the most high who is my refuge no evil shall be, be allowed to befall you no plague come near your tent and in that moment at that night we were we were so uh, at peace about the God that we serve and follow who is watching over us and protecting us and taking care of us and uh, we want to gather together uh, via online, uh, and we want to give God the glory that he deserves. And that's one thing that we're going to be committed to in this season, is giving God the glory no matter what the circumstances. And so will you pray with me? Father, we come before you this morning. God, we want to honor you. We want to serve you. God, we want to, um, to lift our eyes to the hills. That's where our help comes from. And God, this morning, in the midst of of maybe some fear and some confusion and some uncertainty. God, we take refuge in you for you are our God. And we praise you and we give you the glory because we know that uh, there is nothing that you can't do. And so let's worship together. Amen. this morning. In just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. In just one word, darkness starts to retreat. In just one time, I feel the presence of heaven. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a 
sing this out together. And I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. So let faith arise and let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. And I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise and let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. And I will believe for greater things. He's all in motion, praising you, thunder clouds, ringing throughout the heavens, and from every mountain top to every wild ocean, oh, hear all the universe singing praise. Oh, sing praise at every Let all the earth proclaim, great is the Lord our God, oh praise Him forever. Let all that is within me, let's magnify His name, cause great is the Lord our God, praise Him forever. For the life is given, praising you, rescue one. Let's join in the sound of heaven from every mountain top to every wild ocean. Oh, hear all the universe sing praise. Oh, sing praise.
worshiping together, uh, that, that God has not abandoned us, that God is in our midst, that God is working in and through us, that there is nothing that he can't do. He will receive praise because he is the Lord. Not even, the, as the scriptures say, the gates of hell will prevail against him and his kingdom. What a powerful reminder in the circumstances that we find ourselves. We really have a unique opportunity in the history of our nation to be the hands and feet of Jesus to our neighbors and in our communities. We've gotten a number of calls and, and emails from, from some of you here at the church office that, that are looking for ways to help the most vulnerable people in our community. Simple things that like checking on your, your elderly neighbors or, or friends or relatives to, to providing food for students who rely on breakfast and lunch at school and finding how, how can we help in this situation. That's so encouraging for us that we take seriously the call of Jesus to love our neighbors. And in the midst of the, the fear that we are looking to help. There's lots of things that have been suspended or canceled. Exhibit A is we're doing church online this morning. But the mission of the church continues. We might not all be gathered here in this room together, but the mission of the church continues. The mission of the church still stands. Our gatherings look different than they ever have in the history of community church, but the mission remains the same because the church is not a building. The church is not a destination. The church is people. We are a community of faith bringing faith to our community, even in this time. So one of the questions that, that we need to have rolling around in our head is what can, what can I uniquely do? What can I uniquely do to move that mission forward? What can you uniquely do to move that mission forward? And as we ask this question, as we follow Jesus together in this, this could be a really powerful powerful season for us and for growth in the kingdom of God. As we ask this question, there's, there's lots of things that this can mean, and some of you have already gotten really creative in this, and we want to encourage you to continue to do that, to find those ways that only you can meet certain needs. One of the things that this does mean is being faithful in your giving. Most of the time at this portion of the service is when we have the ushers come forward and we pass the, pass the baskets and we collect the offering. And it's a, it's a time that we collectively say that we are joining God in his work. That we are with him in his work, contributing to his work in our world. And that remains the same even this morning. 
And so while we're not going to pass baskets, you can go online and you can give community-church.com. If you use checks or if you want to send cash as donations, you can send that to 2351 Riff Roan. I believe the, the address is on the screen there. If you don't have a piece of paper to write that down, you can find it on the website. Call the church office. We are committed to joining God in his mission to love our communities, to be a community of faith, bringing faith to the community, even in this time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that in the midst of the confusion and the fear and all of the different complex emotions that we feel, that you remain the same, that you are consistent, that you have not abandoned us, that you are walking with us through this season. And Lord, we look to you as our guide, as our teacher, as our Lord. God, we are thankful that even though we're not all together in the same room, that your presence is still with us. That as we come and we worship you and we say, there's nothing that you can't do, that we will, with all the earth, praise you forever, that you are with us in our midst. Lord, thank you. Give us courage as we continue on this journey as a people. Give us courage. Give us eyes to see the ways that we can be your hands and feet to our neighbors. We love you and we are committed to following you together. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.
So many others have tried their hand at putting together an account of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. They have used reports handed down by the original eyewitnesses who served this word with their very lives. Since I have investigated all the reports in close detail, starting from the story's beginning, I decided to write it all out for you so you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt the reliability of his story. Good morning, Community Church. My name's Alan Cleveland. I'm the senior pastor, and I just welcome you on this day, whether you normally participate at Community Church Rip Road or Community Church New City or Community Church Winter Haven, or this morning, literally scattered all over. We are one church meeting in many, many locations this morning, and so as we come to this time of worshiping the Lord, uh, let's go to his word, and let's go to the word in prayer. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have in this moment, in this moment in history, to gather around you and worship you and worship you through the reading of your word. So Holy Spirit, speak to us. May you drive your point home. May it yield fruit in our lives. May we be a witness and a testimony for the living Jesus Christ as he is Lord of our lives. And it's in his name that we do pray. Amen. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided the property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Many of us recognize that as the beginning of the parable of the prodigal son, a, a powerful parable that, that Jesus shared. And, and a par parable is a powerful teaching point. It's a, a story that has a, a spiritual purpose behind it. As followers of Jesus, even in this season, though we may be restricted in our gatherings and activities, we're never restricted in serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in honoring him and in loving him in all that we do and say. And so as we're in this season, as followers of Jesus together, we want to make sure what is important to Jesus is also important to us. That we take what Jesus values and allow that to shape our hearts so that we value what Jesus values. And we're in this series that we called Luke, a documentary, and we're exploring the life of Jesus. And in exploring the life of Jesus, we discover that rejoicing is the response when the lost are found. So followers of Jesus celebrate when the lost are found. One wintry, below zero night, Susan and I received a frantic phone call, and indeed it was frantic. Our granddaughter, Ivy, greatest granddaughter in the world, bar none, grandfather's preference, what can I say? She was missing her Moosey. Moosey is her pacifier, or was her pacifier at that time. It's it's a moose with a pacifier on, it, on the end of it, and it was gone. 
it didn't make it home. So it must be a Grammy and Papa's house. So mom and dad called us up frantic, wondering where it was. And we entered into to that emergency response mode that we're all familiar with when we lose that set of keys or we misplace our wallet. But certainly nothing can motivate a five alarm alert as a missing mo uh, moosey at bedtime. So we entered into the lost phase uh, with the panic of the parents and the parent and the panic of Ivy, the tears that we could hear on the other end of the phone and that useless question that Papa asks, where did she last have it? Well, then we shifted into the search phrase, phase in which everything is turned upside down and you check the freezer. I mean, I looked in the freezer in the icebox for crying out loud just to see if I could find Moosey. Oh, that kept going until we found Moosey right where it had been left, wrapped up in some blankets from her nap. Well, then we moved into the celebration phase, and it began with a question. On this cold below zero night in the middle of winter, will Papa drive Moosey over to, the, to my house? Well, the relief and sheer bliss on the faces of her parents and the unabashed happiness on that little girl's face made it all worthwhile. Well, what we find here in Luke chapter 15 are stories that Jesus told, parables that Jesus told about the lost being found. And, and there's a reason for the telling of this parable. If we look at the beginning of Luke 15, he's surrounded by a mix of people. In that collection of people certainly are his disciples, uh, but then there are those that uh, would oppose him, as well as those who are hearing his message and responding in powerful ways. But we read this in the first couple of verses. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus goes into these three parables in which he talks about the lost being found that captured the anxiety when something is missing, the energy of the search and discovery, as well as the celebration when what was lost is indeed found. You know, in this lost phase, you, you start in the beginning of the chapter and, and we read that something or someone is missing, whether it's a lost sheep, a lost coin, or in the in this case, that I started a lost son. You know, we don't know what happened in the case of the sheep. Maybe it wandered off as the other 99 went in a different direction. With the coin, maybe it fell off the table and just fell into a crack in the floor. Uh, we know what happened with the son. He wanted to experience life on his terms without the constraints or the restrictions that he felt or he imagined. He, he turned his back on everything he had known, including his relationships. And the depth of the separation uh, are evidenced, are, are, are revealed by what the son says about the sum of his choices. In verse 17, we read, But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Take me as one of your hired hands. Oh, apart from calling out to father, he's not staking any claims on the relationship. That's the degree of separation. That's the degree, the chasm between them. That's the lostness that the young son was experiencing. That's interesting. If you plug the word lost into a word search engine of the Bible, you discover that, yes, there are plenty of times where it talks about something being misplaced. But there are many, many instances where there's a spiritual meaning behind it where there's a spiritual impact to it, where that lostness 
uh, has to do with the separation that exists between God and those who are created in his image. People, men and women, boys and girls, people like, like you and, and like me. Someone might object and say, you know, I know my way. I have a plan for life. I'm not lost. In comparison to others, my life is good. Thank you very much. But throughout Jesus' ministry, and indeed throughout the Word of God, the matter of lostness is how, not how we compare to one another, but how we as sinful creatures compare to the holy, perfect God. We are lost. We are separated if left to ourselves. But thankfully, 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 this is not the end of the story, for we see that there is a search. Oh, this, the shepherd searched in the cracks and the crevices of the areas where his sheep would, would go, and, and he went beyond that to just try to find that lost sheep. Oh, the woman literally turned her house upside down, looking for that coin, and found it. Oh, in the parable, as he's making his way back, expecting the worst, we read in verse 20, he arose and he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The father was watching and he was waiting and he was yearning for his son. He was searching the horizon for that familiar outline, that familiar walk and gait that would indicate that his son was coming home. He longed for his son. If the religious leaders who were listening to this parable thought about it, they could have easily drawn on their knowledge that in any number of times in the Old Testament, there's this picture of the people of Israel being lost, that is, separated from God, but God promising hot pursuit of them. Oh, Jesus sets up the story so that those who are listening would expect the wayward son would be chastised, yelled out, would be cast out finally, especially in light of his confession when he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven. Ultimately, I've sinned against God. And before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the parable, it takes a different turn. Jesus tells the story in a different way that it goes from this fear of judgment to actually notes of celebration. See, the son is preparing for the worst, and those who are listening to Jesus tell this story, they are preparing to hear the verdict. They are preparing for the son to experience the worst. So they are just as surprised when these words come from the mouth of the father. Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this son, my son who was dead, is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now, the story does not end there. It doesn't stop at that moment of celebration because the purpose of the parable is to strip away and reveal the heart. Yes, the heart maybe of that person who feels like they can put themselves in the role of the prodigal son, but also the heart of those who may not even see it coming, that their hearts need to be stripped, their hearts need to be revealed as they reflect the attitude and the response of the older son. 
starting in verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing, and he, and he called out to one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Oh, your father, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. And his father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I've served you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came home, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Though we often say that this is a parable about the prodigal son, if we read it carefully in the beginning of the parable, Jesus said this was about a father with two sons. That, as one writer noted, each one was prodigal in their own way. One, banking all that he had on the inheritance that he received, that he went out and squandered it. The other, basing all on his performance that led to an enhanced sense of pride that he thought he could make claims on the basis of that pride. Well, the religiously arrogant standing there were more concerned about practice and propriety than the person created in God's image who was far from God, but God is bringing home. And Jesus points out that the young son, yes, he broke all their rules, but the older brother denied the person of God by doing away with a message of hope, of grace, and of mercy. You know, we can brush up against that attitude ourselves when we believe that there are those individuals who, in our assessment and according to our standards, don't deserve heaven, but rather deserve to rot in hell. Ours, though, may not be so much the danger of the Pharisees and the scribes from their spiritually arrogant position. Ours, though, might be in the danger of being spiritually complacent and allowing spiritual lethargy to define us. You know, what, what motivates Jesus' heart does not motivate ours. That's what this parable is about. This is what he's calling them to. Read through chapter 15 and ask if, if your heart is emblazoned for, with a passion for those apart from God. Because listen to the response of the Father in the, these last few verses of the parable. Son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. That's the message when Jesus was sharing about the sheep. Uh, at the end of that parable, he said, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. At the end of the parable of the coin, he said, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. That's a mirror for us to look at and ask, where are our hearts? Luke wrote this to Theophilus striving to challenge him and that he might possess certainly a certainty about the message of Jesus Christ. Oh, that, that this person who received this letter, this Theophilus, would be in awe of God's grace and mercy, overwhelmed at God's love for those created in his image. Oh, that he would celebrate the mercy of God directed, yes, towards him. 
that once he was lost, separated from God, but by God's mercy and grace, he was found. And then also, that Theophilus' heart would be moved and motivated by what moves and motivates Jesus' heart. And, and that the rejoicing, the celebration of God's grace and mercy would spill out in a life motivated to share the gospel of Jesus with others. As our worship team comes up to lead us in, in, in a song. This year we started off with a vision, with a desire, with a focus that we would be those people who would value what Jesus values, that our hearts would be shaped by his priorities, by his concerns. Jesus is concerned for those who are far from him. Jesus is desirous, he wants to reach those who do not know him, who are lost and separated. And he calls us, those of us who've experienced the grace and mercy of God, each and every one of us, to reach those around us. So we stated the focus for this year of being each one to reach one. This is a unique moment in history. And it's our moment to live. Followers of Jesus are those who say we will value what Jesus values and we will act upon it. So my prayer is that in the midst of this time, yes, our eyes would be open to the opportunities that are before us. And that we would be a people motivated by the beauty of God's love for his people through Jesus Christ. That we would be humbled and overwhelmed by his love that's been directed at us. And that would indeed motivate us to reach the people around us with the good news that Christ came to rescue. He came to find. He came to call people, his created people, back home. Let's pray. Father, our God, Move our hearts, stir our hearts. May we value what you value, oh God. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you indeed look deep in our hearts and challenge our hearts where there might be a hardness, where there might be an attitude, where there might be an assumption or a presumption on our parts that somehow would get in the way Lord, we desire to be your vessels. We desire to be your people, following you together in declaring to a world that even in this moment is full of fear, full of concern, full of worry. Oh, that in this moment, oh God, each one of us would strive to reach someone else with that message of the sovereign God and who in his love and grace and mercy came to earth, lived, died, and rose on that third day so that our heart and our hope is shaped and defined by all that he's done for us in Jesus Christ. For we pray in his name, to his glory, amen.
sought us out, and we can be found. Um, thank you so much for joining us online. Uh, there are so many things that are going to be kind of a day-to-day -day, uh, updates and what's happening at Community Church. Um, one of the things that we want to continue to be committed to uh, is gathering together in authentic community. And so we want to encourage you to, um, to use uh, the resources that we have available one of the things that we have is a subscription to Right Now Media. Uh, you can go to community-church.com forward slash Right Now Media. Uh, and you can uh, create a login 
and then you have access to thousands and thousands of different studies. You can do that in your home. Uh, you can gather together with a small group of people and do those things together as well. Um, there's lots of other stuff online. Uh, check out our website for uh, updates about kids' things, uh, ways that we can reach out to our community. And uh, again, thank you so much for your patience and your grace in the midst of all of this. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you. God, we thank you that you, um, that you are still in control. God, that we can trust you. And Lord, I think of think of these words, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And God, we want to be people who display a trust in you, a faith that uh, is based on what we cannot see and not on what we do see. And so God, would you help us as your people to walk by faith and not by sight. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.